to office hours. <laughs> um, I had to look at like the screen I have that says what it is in nice big block letters. Um, I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. And I'm joined today with uh, Chris Kedzie. Do you prefer Keds? Yeah, Keds, Keds is yeah, Keds is great. Uh, oops, sorry. I have Two fantastic office hours. <laughs> um, I had Where's to look at like from? the screen I have. Sorry. Okay, I found the source of the echo. I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. <laughs> We're all having a fun time. Um, Chris. Keds, do you want to talk a little bit about your research background? Um, and if you'd like, some of the stuff you're doing at Raza, no spoilers, because uh, I know that there's a lot of stuff that's sort of like in flight and it may or may not work. We'll find out. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am a new Raza or new since January. Uh, but I, before Raza, I was a PhD student working on uh, automatic news summarization and uh, text generation. Uh, and so I guess probably the, the text generation side of my research is probably most relevant to Raza, uh, but someday I, I hope our bots will summarize things for people. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I was pr I'm particularly interested in controllable generation. So uh, there's a lot of really interesting work on large language models and getting them to do interesting things with prompts, but they are not controllable in a variety of interesting and frustrating ways, right? They have no like underlying model of the world or, or state. So if you want them to accurately talk about or reliably talk about information that you know to be true, it can be hard to do that um, with a sort of complete end-to-end -end model. So a bunch of my uh, research has focused on uh, sort of getting uh, neural NLG models or natural language generation models to follow plans or follow some sort of, uh, you know, first mention where if you're describing a coffee shop, you know, where is that coffee shop located? What's its price range? What other kinds of food does it offer? Um, getting getting a model to generate fluent utterances that reliably say the correct information. Um, and yes, yeah, so that's or the, the research side of things that I'm working on. And I I think, and apparently the, the people that determine hiring at Raza also thought that that would be a great uh, uh, thing to explore at Raza. Um, because currently most, I mean, by default and what we definitely advise, right, is the bot utterances should be things that you write when you're building your bots. And 100% uh, agree with that. Um, but it, we're sprinkle of templates. Yeah, so we're thinking. Um, uh, so we just had this con uh, conditional response variation feature that went in uh, in two point six that allows you to kind of uh, cosmetically change the stories without your your story responses without changing the story structure. So maybe you want, um, you know. Uh, Thank you for logging in on your first on your very first login versus um, welcome back. Um, you may want to have a sort of uh, variation in your responses that depends on some slot values that you set. So there's a whole this whole feature which we can talk about, which has no machine learning at all. Um, it actually reduces the number of training stories that you would need to put into TED, which is a great thing from uh, reducing the amount of compute and efficiency. Yeah. Yep. Um, but we're also, yeah, we're so like, you mentioned templates. Uh, I love templates. Uh, I, I actually, I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done combining uh, templates with uh, neural language models uh, because you could create sort of small, uh, you know, like little atomic templates that just fit to describe one thing and maybe use the larger language models to stitch them together to get the, you know, if you're doing like a larger compare and contrast of some items in a database or something like that. And yeah, so those, that's all very like forward looking. We're, we're not, I'm not committing uh, our research team to implementing those next quarter, but uh, things that we're thinking about and definitely want to add more flexibility to response selection, response um, templating, things like that. Ah, exciting times in the future. Yeah. Um, and Amina has a question. Hi Amina, good to see you. Uh, where? Do I find the TensorFlow settings, like how to split between testing and training data? Um, one question. Uh, B, do we resample every time we train a model? And C, 
is there cross validation? Wow. Um, is there cross? <laughs> there, there is cross validation. Um, the, the sorry, the first question was the TensorFlow setting. TensorFlow settings. Um, Does Sarah have them? So I don't know where our TensorFlow settings are. Uh, is my uh, honest answer. Um, uh, That's what I said last week. All right, let's see if we can. No, this is a regular config file. Wow. Uh, <laughs> maybe. Are there specific? I know you can set like the visibility of GPUs to TensorFlow sort of in your shell variables. Is that what is meant? Or is it something more specific? Because there is, there definitely is a. Uh, no, there definitely is a file where you can. Um, no, that's not it. Uh, you can set your TensorFlow like environment variables, like your seed. And I remember seeing a discussion about it. And do I remember where it is <laughs> in the file? system i do not let's see well so if you set your random seeds in the config file that should and you're running on the cpu everything should be deterministic so if you have under like um diet or ted you can set a random seed field you can batch size and epochs i this also might have been something from like 1.x this may not be a thing in 2.x Mm. Rosm Tools TensorFlow environment. Mm, nope, that's a. Um, sorry, I just have the docs open in another uh, another window. Two point three. This is from Rosa Utils. Hmm. TF2 environment settings by doc. And this is, so I always have to double check that I'm in the right repo. Uh, yeah, okay, so there definitely are environment variables. Uh, or at least there were in February of last year. Document there, also there are old TF configs have to be removed. Cool, cool, cool. Comprehensive docs. Can I see the docs? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pop that over. Um, so Rob asked, what did I miss? Nothing so far. Uh, I'm just trying to find the dang TensorFlow's config file. Like, I know you can have it. I do not remember where it is. And that's where we are with this. Uh, let's see. Uh, sorry, and the reason I'm sp spending so much time digging into this is because I think Amina asked last week, and I was like, ask next week when Chris is here. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Failed already. Oh, uh, not at all. This is like deep in the weeds. Runtime environment files. Rouse is where it's a smaller subset of these. Open source. TF config. Okay, but what file is this in? <laughs> um, okay, so it existed in February of last year, and that's about as far as I think I'm gonna get on this one. Um, and as uh, Chris mentioned, you can also set stuff in your config file for a specific uh, file that should be, uh, sorry, a specific part of your pipeline that should um, should work. I, yeah, I mean, I'm curious to know what the specific TensorFlow settings you want to set are. I know that the big ones are which GPUs do you make visible, and that you can do, I believe, with a flag CUDA visible devices. Um, uh, that is independent of Raza that you would just set in your shell before running Raza. 
see if I can find the environment settings in here meanwhile. Environment settings. CICD. And we can come back to here. Interesting. Okay, so I wonder if this is something because when did um when did 2.0 launch? I want to say it was like less than a year ago. It was a 2.0 launch. So this could be something that has been folded into a different space. Uh October? That seems too late. November, October? Okay, yeah. So this this would have been in Raza 1.x. Um anyway. Yeah. Uh so that's been a very long detour <laughs> with maybe no satisfactory answer. Uh uh, and Amina has a question. In test test stories at YAML, we have test stories that are made to the mood bot. And once I run Raza test, it will focus on that folder. Can I delete it or should I specify my test stories? Ooh, that would be something you would do in the uh, command line interface. So let me pull that up. Uh, do, 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 do. Let me run down to test. Rachel, you just looking stuff up in the docs. Yes. <laughs> Roz is very complex. I can't remember everything. Uh, also, I could just click <laughs> on the shortcut. Whew. All right. Um, mm -mm. Okay, so you can... Uh, I'm looking for whether or not you can um, specify your input stories. Yes, okay, so um, to specify a specific folder, uh, Amina, if you're not, if you've moved away from MoveBot, you can delete the test from MoveBot, you should be fine. Um, by default, the tests go in a folder called tests. Uh, there you go. So by default, they go in a folder called tests at the same level as your data folder um, and your actions folder if it's a little bit fancier. Um, but you can put them anywhere you like and point the command line interface to it by using dash s and then uh, the path to your file or folder. Is there um, a caveat? I don't know if this is 100% true, but I think it might be that the story, the test stories file has to have test in its name or it will miss it. Hmm. I don't know. Presumably if you point to a file, it shouldn't matter. We could test it if you want, but I'd have to reset up a new view. Uh, don't worry about it. Um, yeah. So I think that is hopefully uh, helpful. And then I think um, Chris already answered your question about resampling every time we train. Did you? I don't think I did. Um, uh, resampling what? Um, I think this is the test train split. So if you're if you have a you should you should have a separate test set and we don't resample that split for you if you're pointing to the test set. Although internally, I believe or when you're running on when you're running Raza train, um, which would be cool to see. Um Jersey flags. Yeah, I do believe it does. You can have um, so a held out set or validation. Out, maybe? No, I think that might be where it's saving the model. No, it's restored. Keep going down. Maybe the persist training data? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just NLE. Cool, it might be specific to NL train NLU. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to, there we go. Uh, get the sidebar to go away by zooming in. Um, train Rasa. Screech. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. Train Rasa NLU model using NLU data for paths to the file. Policy configuration, domain specification, red merge together, data augmentation to use during training, 
that's um core that's not all you right these are good questions amina uh and i appreciate you asking them as always you bring the good questions Uh, Kalidas, sorry if I'm saying that wrong, says, uh, hello, I just installed Raza on my PC and I'm building a chatbot. It's really great. Oh, fantastic. Uh, welcome to the Raza community. We're happy to have you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Chris is getting something up. So your next question, I'm using Camembert since my chatbot is in French. What is the added value according to you uh, and how can I see difference with a pre-trained model? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I would, in this case, because it's a camembert is pretty big, um, I would probably do some A-B testing, right? So of course you can do cross-validation um, and you know, um, you know, run some training data, but um, you know, and also we really believe you should get people to talk to your assistant and their quality of interaction should guide your engineering process. Um, so I would um, train one version with Camel Bear, one version without, and have two people talk to it uh, and talk to each and just see which one they prefer or, or more than two. But um, I think two will give you some, if there is a big difference, some interesting signal. Uh, and I would say if there isn't a big difference, I would go with a thing that's lighter weight because Compute's expensive, <laughs> and we're not all made of money. Um, yeah, and I think in general, the benefit of pre-trained models is if the data that was used to train them um, is a good representation of the data that your model is seeing in production, pre-training allows your model to handle a wider variety of things, or using a pre-trained model, than you um, providing training data yourself because it will have seen more things, if that makes sense. So that's sort of the big, big benefit at a very high level. Uh, yeah. Do you find anything, Chris? Uh, on the, the, I did not find anything on the training, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, uh, but I agree with your comments on when to use a uh, pre-trained model. I, I, I think it's like, it's all about the vocabulary. Um, like when, if, if you're training a model from scratch, you need more data to represent all the different ways. Like you'll, you just need your model to have seen examples of the specific words and the utterances that you're expecting to handle. And that might be a hard thing to bootstrap if you have kind of, if you're expecting a very um, diverse or unexpected uh, amount of input. And thankfully, like a pre-trained model will be a little bit more, will probably be a lot more exposed to the, the broader swaths of the vocabulary. Um, uh, so that's that's kind of the main advantage. It just has better representations or, or it's just seen specific words more frequently during the pre-training process than you would probably be able to do by collecting use case specific uh, utterances. Yeah. Although I will say there is, star there, <laughs> look at the footnote, really depends on the language you're working on. Mm. Basically, if, you're, if your language is spoken by rich people, probably a pre-trained model will get you a big benefit. If it is not, probably it won't, because it probably won't have as much data. Yeah, it's just sort of the, uh, one of the many inequalities in the world. Definitely. Um, uh, okay. Oh, sorry. I was just going to add, in, and also like use case, like if if mm. if um, you're you know building a bot for a very niche like set of uh, products or or domain that doesn't get talked about a lot on the internet, um, it's probably not going to have great representation or representations of the words. If there's overlap, may be skewed towards the the broader. Like the how, like how it's being talked discussed on the internet and not um, and not necessarily carry the same associations in its representation for your task. So, Definitely. like 
vests in financial reports right. mean something very different from vests in fashion magazines, as an example. Um, yeah. Uh, so Amina says, when I add a new story and I see the assistant doesn't act accordingly, what should I do? Train again? It always works when I add a rule, but I don't want my assistant to be rule-based 100%. I'm going to add that little caveat. Um, yeah. So by training again, I'm assuming you've trained the first time for, for folks who haven't used your assistant. Um, when you change the training data, you need to retrain the model for those changes to be shown in your assistant. It doesn't like automatically update online. Um, it would be possible to do that, but it would be very expensive. <laughs> like, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, so what happens when your story doesn't work? And this is something that you've been thinking about a lot, Chris. So yeah. I have some more insight. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the first thing I would do is look when you run, uh, you could run, if it, that story is in your, if the, you could point your test, uh, Raza test at that particular story and see um, in the output, it produces a directory called um, failed stories or story, I think it's failed stories. Something like that. Something yeah. like that. Um, and and that will list like every story that it got wrong, and you'll be able, you'll be able to see side by side um, uh, what you expect, what the correct uh, action would be, and what the dial what the policy yeah failed test stories, um, and what the actual policy did, and that might give you some insight into um, uh, you know maybe that you have maybe the bulk of your training data is suggesting to do something else and you've only added one kind of patch or one one kind of example story to suggest otherwise and so you may need to come up with more example stories that exhibit similar behavior would be um, another way to go about it i think one so this is something that we're still trying to figure out internally but just adding one training example for a machine learning model is often not enough to get it to generalize in the ways that you expect. Mm. Um, so you you may think when you're sort of creating the correction story or you're trying to add an additional behavior, it might be good to think about other places where you might maybe adapt existing stories that you have um, or create new stories that show examples of this behavior in slightly different situations so that you kind of get um, just a more representation. The more the more um, uh, you can represent Describe that, what happens. yeah, uh, in different situations, uh, the better, generally. Um, so that being said, I think I'm going to stick up for rules and that uh, like if you really need something to reliably happen, uh, I would definitely use a rule. and no shame in rules. I think uh, rules get a bad rap, but they're very explainable, which is great. Um, uh, obviously, you can get, if you have uh, a huge collection of rules, that probably can be just as inscrutable as a very complex machine learning model. Um, so a lot of this comes down to like design and organizing scale. And, yeah, and scale. Uh, uh, but if the rule is working, I would, I would say great. Um, uh, yeah. Two other things I might think about. Um, so first of all, if you don't have a memoization policy, I would definitely make sure you do have that. And that just says, Hey, if I see something in the training data that I've seen before, keep doing that. Um, Actually, I have three things. <laughs> the second thing is um, little chunks of stories. So rather than having complete conversations, you have, you know, the relevant couple turns uh, because they'll be sort of concatenated. Um, as long as that is like a chunk that will occur together and you're okay with it being like sandwiched between other chunk examples that you have. I, I don't know why I'm using that word here. Little conversation snippets. Um, and the third thing is you might... Um, fine-tune your fallback policy a tiny bit because if the correct next turn is being taken right but 
the confidence is too low because you don't have a lot of training examples. Um, you might be tripping your fallback policy when you don't want it. And as just a general rule, the more stories you have, the higher your fallback policy can be. Um, the fewer stories you have, you might need to like bump it down a little bit. Um, yeah. And would you see that in the, so in the like um, failed test stories, it would say like fault, like the action, if the fallback policy was triggered, it would say action fallback something, something. So, yeah. Yeah, you, you, you can definitely tell when the fallback policy has yeah. been triggered. Yeah. Um, I'm also using this to learn. I just joined. <laughs> You've been here for a bit. Oh. Uh, and then another question in rules, can, why can we only add one intent? Are you looking to like, do like a conditional thing? Or are you like, why can't I have a longer conversation in rules? Uh, pull this up. Um, if you're asking why you can't have a longer conversation like intent, action, intent, action, um, the more a specific number of things need to happen, just like in general, if you're doing a rule-based system, setting aside ooh, the way it's implemented, sorry, um, the more specific a situation needs to be for something else to occur, the less likely it is to happen, the more time you're going to spend writing something that may or may not actually get used. Right. Um, the the reason machine learning is good is that it generalizes and it generalizes in a way where you don't have to think about all the things that could possibly happen. So just from like a making your life easier standpoint, really long rules are rough, uh, particularly to maintain um, once you're in production. Uh, and I think you can. Uh, 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 uh. I'm trying to think if you can actually have multiple steps. And I do not know if that's actually true. I think it's, I think it is hard coded to only have one intent. You can have multiple actions on either side of the intent. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that is just to prevent you from going overboard with rules though. So you could Probably I shouldn't say this. You maybe you, know, you could probably get the same behavior by stringing together multiple rules. Uh, but uh, moderation and as is generally a good um, policy in life and in rule and bot writing. I think. Yeah, definitely. And I, I mean, like there are definitely places for like completely rule driven systems um and those places are when you have short extremely predictable extremely repetitive conversations and people don't want to do that many things right so a good example would be um you know uh like a lot of people are you know doing curbside pickup right so uh, or at least in the us um so if you like go to a store you know you interact with their their bot somehow you're like i'm here i'm in the slot end of conversation it's always going to go the same um and then have a way to like talk to a human if you have like a specific question that would be a good place for a rule-based assistant but if someone's like um you know doing something much more complex like um i'm trying to come up with a good example of something much more complex booking a wedding venue <laughs> where there's a lot of considerations um, and a lot of questions people are going to want to ask and different types of uh, information they're going to need. Um, and it's probably not always going to go the same way because some people may ask about capacity. Some people may ask about price. Some people may ask about, you know, um, you know can I bring my own caterer or whatever? Um, that would probably not be a great place for a completely rule-based system because having more flexibility in your system makes it more useful. Anyway, that's my rant. <laughs> Um, and sometimes you just need to buy, buy, uh, buy or build just like a simple system that solves your problem, right? Not all engineering is uh, the Empire State Building. Sometimes it's a chicken coop. And there are more chicken coops than Empire State Buildings. Very true. Yeah. Um, so we're waiting for the next question. I think we've got to all of them. 
Yeah. Oh, also just practically, um, rules decide what your assistant does next. And if I had to have multiple turns of the user saying something, I wouldn't know like whether or not to trigger a roll to figure out what to do next. Does that make sense? Because I'd have to like wait. So I'd have to pick something to do next, right? Hmm. And then the person would have to say something else, right? And then how do I decide what to do the thing in the middle? Because the rule doesn't apply yet, but all of the other policies oh, yeah. would. Yeah. So just from like an implementation standpoint, I don't know how multi-turn rules would work unless everything was rule-based. Yeah, I think that is a great point. I think right now what would happen is it would just match the, like it's kind of like a memoization policy essentially. Yeah. Um, and at that point it should be a story because then you can use it as training data. Yeah, I guess that's a great, uh, maybe like if you have the memoization policy and you write out the story, you are functionally making that rule, that multi-turn rule. Yep. Yeah, I hope that helps. <laughs> that was a lot of um, discussion about buildings. Um, so we're waiting for the next question. Chris, yep. what would you say is the single most well not like not mistake but like most common misconception that people have about machine learning and nlp that you run into oh boy uh this, the i think that that generalization is easy to get or that generalization from a machine learning model resembles at all human kind of generalization so mm -hmm. i think it's a well, I wouldn't claim that a machine learning model is necessarily a completely blank slate. Like I think they have like the models themselves have biases. Um, those biases are very, very little resemble like a human biases and how they might respond to something unusual or outside like the way that I might respond to an unusual utterance if I was um, sitting in for a bot would be very different. Um, than a, than a machine learning model and we just have we just bring very very different representations to bear on the same computational problem and uh and so often um we use metaphor about human language understanding to talk about nlp but it is pretty much a metaphor for explanatory purposes um and I mean, like one of the great, so like this is an NLP specifically, but when you're learning about multi-layer perceptrons in neural networks, often the example is you're learning a, um, you have sort of uh, for image classification, right? You would have lower level, the layer, the, the lower layers learn sort of fundamental features, like atomic features of the image. So maybe if you're classifying um, digits, you know, you're learning like uh, like serifs and 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 uh, lines and and uh, curves and things. And then at the higher level layers, they pick out sort of a, you know a seven is a combination of a lot of a, a vertical slash and a horizontal line feature, right? And it's all very interpretable in that way. And uh, because the the well, arguably the you know multi-layer perceptron has none of the real physiological biases that humans have uh, about perception or the conceptualization of writing systems like we understand a causal story about how that seven became a seven right there was a vertical slash act like you had to actually draw it or type it um right and none of that conceptualization is in the model um and so it by like out of the box, it doesn't even understand that there are constituent parts as such. And so it's actually, if you if you actually interrogate the model, it's not really learning this kind of uh, compositional representation at all. Uh, it's learning some strange kind of mixture representation that again, is really hard to explain or articulate from a human centric point of view because there's so little of our, we so little bias shared. And I'm using bias. Bias is probably a loaded word, um, uh, but I don't mean necessarily anything negative here or or statistical bias. I mean uh, just that uh, our represent our systems for representing the same perceptual input are very different, uh, and so they'll behave very differently. 
Um, so that's a very long-winded divergent answer. Uh, um, and I apologize, I think there's some music playing in my courtyard, which I can't do anything about. That's okay. I don't think it's loud enough for us to get to copyright. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think with computer vision in particular, um, something that I think often surprises people is that as human beings, right, as like people who have, you know, certain, you know, biological, you know, processes and proclivities that we've evolved, uh, and also as, you know, beings living in a society, um, the way that we interact with things is informed by so much outside of the specific task that we're doing. And a machine learning model does one thing, well, I, or like, or it could be multitask learning, but pretend that we're not talking about multitask learning. Uh, but a machine learning model does one thing and only knows about, I use knows very um, broadly here, uh, the things it's seen, right? So a um, good example from computer vision is that as humans, we care a lot about silhouettes. Outline is something that we are really good at picking up. We're really good at like picking up like contrast and that's like a human Cognitive bias that we have um, Machine learning vision models pick up on patterns of pixels Right, they don't care about silhouettes to the same degree that we do and for us That's the most obvious thing, but that's not the way the machine learning model is interpreting it, right? So similarly um, in you know some of the work with you know, like uh, natural language inference, which with big language models, um, as humans, we read the sentence, right? And we link that to our understanding of the world and our ability to, you know, um, create conceptual mappings. Um, and we use that information to make a decision. Whereas a machine learning model, it only knows about the words, right? It only knows about the, the pixels of language, if you will. Um, and that's all it's using. It's not creating. A conceptual model it is just using you know the pixels it's been given um, to really just stretch the metaphor pretty much to the breaking point um, and since our experience with learning is human learning I think we have a pretty strong you know speaking of cognitive bias a pretty strong desire to be like it's like me right like I want to form a connection right we're doing the same thing we're doing it the same way obviously but it's just not not the case Hundred percent. I think it's I think it's underappreciated. I even did it by focusing on just the perceptual input, but so much of our so like, I, arguably, I'm speaking. This is like podcast level knowledge. I <laughs> like I believe that like one of the major evolutionary reasons for having a brain is understanding social context, uh, or like having as large a brain as we do. We're spending so much time. Uh, like our human childhood is like much longer than other most other animals, um, and a large part of that is learning about the importance of social signals and factors. And uh, so, and language is really hard to detach the process of language understanding and generation from the surrounding social processes, which again, BERT has none, like our, our favorite large pre-trained language models have none of. Um, so that that's a, it's an interesting, it's like trying to navigate in a, uh, yeah, I guess the, the vision, like the, the visual metaphor is it's, we're trying to navigate visually, but maybe we don't appreciate silhouettes at all. We just uh, can see texture. Um, it's a, just a hard thing. There is a great, I can, I will not be able to find this, but in the, in the video game learning in like the, like, um, you know, reinforcement learning to play video games literature, there was a great paper I saw once where they um try to recode or remap the the levels as if to make it perceptually like what the machine learning model would see and because like when you if you just look at like a, a video game um it's actually like it, you almost don't see it but you sort of know like what is it even if you don't know what game you're looking at you can kind of intuit okay that's a platform that maybe the character can stand on and those look like spikes and maybe that's not something you'd want to jump on Right. And all these like things you just take for granted, um, uh, they, they like pop out to you as affordances or as, as things that you know that you can interact with. And you know that. And but that knowledge is coming from somewhere. Um, 
And so they had like re skinned all the like platforms and objects and things. So you really couldn't use those biases and it's like impossible to play <laughs> the game because it's just like different. Uh, it's a attack of plaid patterns that make no sense to you. <laughs> Uh, but I bet the like reinforcement learning system could learn to use it yeah. in about the same time as a very human friendly system. Yeah. 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 We're like that thing's sparkly. I should go touch it. Like that's learned knowledge that you've gained in a social context. Yeah. And I think this is really relevant to chatbots in particular because by moving into the conversational domain, right? By using conversation, we are entering a social contract because I know how conversations work because I have them every day with other humans and I have a set of very strong assumptions. And I think part of the reason why, at least historically, people really don't like chatbots is that their assumptions are violated, right? Like the the good pragmatics of like, uh, if I say, I'd like a table. I don't want a physical table. I want to book a time to eat at your restaurant. And if you're just looking at the semantics, 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 <laughs> you're not going to get that information out. Um, and not being able to interact as like a partner and by violating those expectations is very frustrating uh, as a user. So the benefit of using machine learning models, speaking of generalizability, if you can get to the point where your model can handle things that really hasn't seen before, but that are similar to things that's seen before, because it's seen enough similar things that it has a good sort of general mapping, um, then you can help to get to the point where the model can take in more flexible input, it can respond in a more flexible way, and it you start to get back some of that conversational competence interlocutor, linguist words, jargon, jargon, jargon. Um, but you start to get back some of that feeling of having a conversation um, and having, you know, not just doing all the work yourself. Um, yeah. Anyway, chatbots are hard. <laughs> That's the, the end of that rant. I don't understand, Rachel. Would you like to hear more about my recent <laughs> projects <laughs> or something yeah. else? <laughs> um, case in point, yeah. Yeah, what are you what are you working on that you wanna wanna share? Also, if anyone has any um, any questions, you are absolutely not interrupting. Interrupting. You're not interrupting. Please interact. Feel free to ask your questions. I will read them. What are you working on, Chris? Yeah. Um, what am I working on? Um, I am working on uh, Intent Ted is a, a feature that we're hoping to get integrated into a. a um, new version of Raza at some point that will predict um, actually the user's intent. Or it'll, it's basically like a user, a model of the the user. Um, and we're we're thinking that this might be useful to um, indicate uh, as you're building the bot what sort of story branches are underrepresented in your training data and where you need to add. Um, uh, so this would be like a a model that would say. Um, okay, this this intent here is pretty unusual at this this point in the story, and if that and you could look at that and say, oh, that's concerning because it seems totally reasonable to me, and that would suggest that you would need to add some more extras, data. yeah, some more more training data to cover that particular um, contingency. Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, at least TBD. TB, TBD. On the space. Yeah. Um, I am working on uh, ethical usage guidelines for uh, conditional response variations that will hopefully turn into a blog post. Um, nice. So, uh, and this gets into like larger sort of how you design your bot, whether it has a personality, if it does like what, what, um, you know, implicitly, it's going to talk like some someone or some uh, uh, population segment, and you should be thinking about that those choices um, uh, uh, when you're when you're designing a bot. There's there's uh, several good books in this area too that I could probably recommend. I just got conversations with things, which I'm enjoying. 
Yeah, that's on my to read list. Uh, it sounds really good. And the author will be at L3 AI. Oh my gosh. Plug, plug, plug. Pretty sure. If that's not the case, sorry for being wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like 90% sure though. Let me see. Anna Rogers. She's so great. I'm so excited. Uh, everyone is great. I just happened to see uh, Anna and Ayodele. That should be fabulous. Uh, uh, Brandis is also fantastic. Really looking forward to these. Um, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe that's the case. Um, yeah. Um, Sorry. That yeah. face was I smell toast. I think Ooh. it is just toast, though. <laughs> I think someone's toasting something. Hashtag apartment life. Um, uh, yeah. And yeah, uh, we're, yeah, we're, we're pretty, so like with, we're experimenting with like um, user simulation models right now as maybe an extension of um, how you might sort of develop, a, develop your own chatbots before. Uh, so user simulation, not as a replacement for testing on real people, but as a way of um, helping you develop so that when you make small changes, you can kind of get a sense of whether that would break your existing um, model or not. I think right now it's, it can be difficult. Like if you add, you add that one story, does, is it going to break everything? Mm -hmm. um, uh, like really big assistance. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, when you start to have, uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of stories, it can be difficult. Millions of conversations a day. Yeah. It can be difficult. Scale is a challenge. Yeah. Um, which is, I think that's actually an exciting part of the job. Like, that's something that I'm really interested in is how do we um, empower people to make those uh, choices at scale and know what, like, you change one pebble how does it re redirect the avalanche of conversation um uh because i think that's that's hard right now on pretty much every platform um so i think that's like an exciting research area that i don't have any answers to yet but uh Enjoy your research exactly uh and we have a question from amit excuse me <clears throat> amit um are there any other competing alternatives to modeling conversations other than the intent entity modeling of Raza? Um, I would say there's competing alternatives inside Raza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you want to talk on that a little bit? Yeah, um, right. So That's we've been talking about this move to end-to-end -to -end, uh, learning where you would just actually have stories. Uh, sorry, you just have your sort of bot conversations and the user responses. Um, and even in that context, actually, I believe there would be entity extraction happening and that and those entities would get sort of represented or featureized um, in your model that would affect the subsequent next turn predictions. Um, so that's definitely an alternative um, uh, paradigm. I think there are other so and i think that's definitely sort of like the most popular um machine learning paradigm yeah. uh out there right now that's kind of the 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 hot new thing or it's not that new anymore i guess but <laughs> if if you can remove the you know the the conventional wisdom in a lot of machine learning is if you can remove the actual modeling the or the bit part. the yeah all the, all the like the little choices and just have a lots of examples of inputs and outputs. Um, the model can just learn to do that, and you don't have to explain. In theory, like in theory, that works, but you do need a lot so of much data. data, like way more data than you'd think. Yeah, the I mean, the other um, the I, I, I so sticking up for intents a bit, like it is a useful organizing principle, I think, for mm -hmm. sort of structuring your conversation. Um, uh, cause even in the, like, 
end-to-end -end version of, of a conversation, you kind of have to like think about, okay, I have this sort of how I got, I have a prefix of how I got to this point and I still need to like come up with lots of examples of how to say yes in this particular or no in this particular context. Uh, so you're still functionally behaving like there is an intent there. Um, mm. And if you remove that label completely, I think it, it will make organization difficult, but this is definitely, we're definitely like exploring how to do more end-to-end -end learning. Um, and as I think a, it's particularly helpful for like as augmentation, right? Specifically for turns where an intent doesn't make sense because something can be in multiple intents or the utterance contains like five different intents and you just want a way to be able to, to deal with it. Yeah. I mean, it's something that is totally, I think, overlooked would be like you could construct reasonable priors for when. So, you know, the, the canonical example of where intents fail is like uh, good afternoon, right? Good afternoon can happen at the beginning of the conversation and at the end of the conversation. And if you just look at good afternoon in isolation, you don't, it's not really, um, it's difficult to, uh assign. assign what what the intent is um mm -hmm. and so if you're you end up having to do a weird thing maybe where you create a like joined goodbye hello intent or something like that is maybe a kludgy solution um but uh if you are looking at that in conversation you really don't need a huge deep learning model to understand like well if goodbye if good afternoon is said at the beginning of the conversation my kind of my prior there is that's the that's a hello or greet intent, and if it happens toward the end or the middle, that's or well, if it's happening after a few turns, right? Then presumably it is a goodbye, um, and we don't have a. Uh, I think it's hard to articulate those kinds of things um, right now within a story, but that would I think save a lot of grief on this kind of this, this uh, mm. the Procustean bed of intents of trying to uh, uh, figure out what what is it more, is it a, is it hello or goodbye? Um, and uh, with, without, with, in, a, in a computationally light way, that is also again, understandable or from the outside, it's like why um, that behavior would happen, I think, there are many other kind of frameworks that you, I, I think it's, this is like all super speculative, but this, this kind of thing I love to think about endlessly is like, how would, how else would you redesign conversations to work? One thing that um, I know has been explored in the dialogue policy literature um, is to basically, it's like right now we sort of have a sort of direct, if you say I'm going to San Antonio, it's extracting, you know, San Antonio is a city and, it's extracting um, maybe that city and that sort of deterministically gets mapped to a slot and then you do something based on that slot mapping. But um, uh, but if I said, I think I'm going to San Antonio as a human with your human biases, you might have a little, you might like not totally file that away as certain. You might say, well, I, I'm sort of only 70 or 80% sure that he's going to San Antonio and you might, ask more follow-up questions, um, right? And I think you could imagine a similar kind of uh, policy uh, framework or idea for, for um, or well, the people in uh, or dialogue researchers have where you, you know, have a kind of a Bayesian model about the different slots that you need to fill. And mm -hmm. until you've, uh, until your model has achieved some, you know, level of certainty, yeah, yeah. Ab about them, it continues to ask questions and follow-ups. And I think that, that would be an interesting um, alternative way of structuring conversations that's less about writing stories and more about like, it's kind of like playing 20 questions or it's like designing a 20 questions. I don't know if that is a game that people know, but you get, uh, you know, you basically you- you um, uh, Asking until you're sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's also some work on like um, graph models on like structuring a conversation is like a know, graphical database um, and like updating things over 
as more, more input is received. Um, yeah. Uh, Abby says, yeah, hopefully that helped, damn it. There are lots of approaches. Um, also, I would say, just as a background for you, Raza did not in invent intents and entities. Um, that's been around for a while. <laughs> Pretty, pretty storied approach. Um, Avi wants to know about policies in Raza apart from Ted. Mm. I'll pull that up. Yeah. Let us go to our zoo of policies. <laughs> Indeed. Do, do, do. Uh, here we go. So um, we have, uh, by default, you'll get actually an ensemble. <laughs> So there will be a number of policies, and um, one of them will win and determine what happens at another on the next turn. Um, and I believe, no, sorry, I was going to say that there's going to be like an update to the order that that happens, but that's only it only affects training, and it's in the future. Ignore that aside. Um, so from uh, the machine learning policies, um, Ted is sort of the the workhorse here, which is a transformer based dialogue policy. Um, you also have the memoization policy, which is just like, do what you saw in the training data. Uh, and this one will often win if it is, if this is seen, if something is seen in your training data, it will probably win because the confidence is just like set to be very high and confidence is what is used to pick which, which policy to go for. Uh, and the augmented memoization policy, which um, takes your stories, takes out little snippets and shuffles them. Um, if you are, if you've been playing around with your augmented memoization policy and you're finding that training time is starting to get extremely long, uh, this is often the culprit. Uh, and then also we have a rule policy, uh, which combines everything that is deterministic prior to training, right? So this is everything that besides the memoization policy, um, without having looked at any sample data, I know what will happen. If X happens, Y will happen. So this includes um, straight up rules, but it also includes forms, um, which are a way of collecting a bunch of slots in a, you know, a rule-based way. Yeah. Do you have anything else want to add there? Um, uh, is it, and also uh, some deprecated ones. I may, um, uh, I can't tell if I, I may have uh, had a, a Zoom, Zoom fatigue. When you were talking about, uh, memoization versus augmented memoization policy augmented memoization lets you look at a slice of history as opposed to the entire history is that right i believe so yeah and which is which i i found confusing on my first read through this so like memoization policy if you ever it's if you ever deviate from the um like from the training from a, a training story it will just mm -hmm turn off whereas memoization policy or augmented memoization policy is probably more useful in that you can kind of set um you know a slice of, of his it's not going all the way back to conversation starts so you can kind of use it to um you know reset to like if you're if you you know continually are going to uh, uh do you have any more questions um kind of attentive base state. I don't know what you'd call it. Um, this can be helpful. Yeah. So those are our policies um, and some old ones, which you could get back if you wanted them. But oh, also the fallback policy mm. is also in our in our rule policy. Uh, yeah, hope that helps. Uh, and we've got a couple more questions. Do you have time, Chris? Sure. I know you've been very Zoomed this morning. <laughs> um, the nature of now. That's true. Uh, Asam wants to know, if I use Arabert, which I'm guessing is for Arabic, as a pre-trained language model, as you know, Arabert has its own tokenizer. I did not know that. <laughs> That's new information to me. Uh, my question is, if I have a sentence with five words and I label the fifth word as an entity in my NLU data, and the language model tokenizer output is like seven words, should I worry about the entity extraction with diet? So this is a case where 
an entity overlaps, it sounds like, with a tokenization boundary. If you are, we only allow one tokenizer in the featureization pipeline. So if, and, but I'm not sure if um, Arabert's tokenizer is, if that's what's being used um, uh, for tokenization, then it, um, at least in the entity boundaries shouldn't break shouldn't i would think uh break um if you're if you're using that tokenization but i it, it, you can also have multi-token entities yeah so i think you i think you should be good is the question what's the the question is a concern about it um it is it, could this happen or when this happens what what will happen um uh, should I worry about the entity oh. extraction with diet? Um, I think it'll get caught. Yeah, I mean, I I test it obviously, but I think it should work. I don't know what would happen if your token boundary, if your entity boundary is in the middle of a token, but I think the whole token gets included. I've never actually tried it. I think your your entity annotations have to respect the underlying tokenization, or a, war a warning is emitted at the very least also sounds plausible try and find out yeah let us know on a future yeah, episode um and do if it's not working please file a bug uh on our github so we we know about it uh because it sounds like something would affect a lot of people uh yeah uh nixon said uh there's a problem of spam on every social media platform uh people get around the blocks can raza help in any way not like maybe, but it would have to be pretty hacky. It's not, that is not the use case for which Raza was built. Agree. No. Um, yeah, and Avi says thank you. You're very welcome. All right, I don't want to keep you too, too long today, Chris. Uh, and it looks like we've gotten to everybody's questions, so I hope that helped. Um, yeah, thanks for joining. We'll be back tomorrow for paper reading. We're going to finish up the, um, the the Google paper where they replace attention with multilayer perceptrons uh, in Transformers. Uh, we're not going to read the computer vision section. We are going to read the uh, uh, NLP section. Uh, and then on Friday, we're going to continue with live coding. So yeah, hope I'll see you then. Thanks for joining, Chris. Thanks for, thanks for having everybody. me. This is the camera. <laughs> Thanks for joining everybody uh, and I'll see you later.